Bernard County. Visit SpaceCoastTPO.com.
surprised by all of those things. And when we talk about where we want to go with resiliency, there's another piece to that puzzle, which is mitigation. Mitigation has been around for a long time. If you're not familiar with it, it is a fancy Scrabble word. Um, mitigation basically means you solve known problems today so that we don't have to deal with them tomorrow. That's different than resiliency, right? Resiliency is solving future problems today, not putting ourselves in those known problems. And sometimes when we talk about resiliency, we conflate the two topics. And it's important we keep them separate because A, there's separate funding for them, so we want to attack both streams. And B, it changes how we look at it, right? So with mitigation, we're fixing problems that we know are issues, right? So we have areas that flood, we look at increasing stormwater runoff there, right? We look at how we manage water in those areas. If they're repetitive properties, we talk about the idea of maybe, you know, acquisition and maybe working with those residents to get out of that floodplain. When we talk about what that looks like from a resiliency standpoint, we need to be smarter about how we build in the floodplain. Brevard County has a lot of water. Right? We have 72 miles of coast, we've got the St. John Shore West, we've got two rivers. I think it's around 35% uh, of our total land mass is actually water. We're always going to have a water problem. How we deal with that is important. How we look at that is important. And when we talk about resiliency, it really is making sure that we understand our risk as we build and expand. We understand our risk as we work through our public education ceremonies, right? as we talk with them. And an important piece of resiliency in our conversation today, and really all day, is sometimes we talk about resiliency or mitigation, we have this idea that it's a government problem that requires a government solution. And that couldn't be furthest from the truth. There is a large part of resiliency that is an individual problem, is a resident issue, right? We are all in this together. Nothing that we do as a government or as a private sector, is going to make nearly the impact that we do as residents and members of this community. Right? There's a lot we can do as residents to become more resilient. So what do I mean by that? So doing simple things, right? So having shutters on your home, or plywood protecting your windows, or having impact resistant doors. Doing things to increase your roof tie down to better protect it from wind. If you do have issues with water on your property, trying to figure out how you can better mitigate that. So can you change your grading? Can you add more drainage so that you don't need 87,000 sandbags? Uh, and because and I keep hitting sandbags because what frustrates me is people will wait in line for eight hours to get 10 sandbags. I don't know what, I mean, that's great, I mean, but I, what that tells me is I hope you're really prepared because you just cost yourself eight hours of preparation for 10 sandbags, and 10 sandbags, unless you have a very small space to protect, isn't going to do it. And if you're waiting till then, well, you're already behind the eight ball. And that's not gonna be how we get to a more resilient community. We talk about transportation, like well, that's what we're supposed to do today. Um, <laughs> You know, we talk about transportation from a roadway standpoint, how we get more resilient, how we increase evacuation routes, how we add more capacity, how we make traffic flow better, and I love all of those things, right? It's good for us day to day, it's nice when we move traffic and have large people on the road for any sort of large event, but when we talk about our long-term resiliency plan for our roadway network is, especially for evacuation, the goal should be less people on the road. The goal, should, the goal should be people can stay where they are because their structures are safer and better protected, right? Wind isn't the threat that it is today, right? We've handled the flooding problem. We're dealing with the power situation because surprise, every time we have a storm, there's gonna be a power outage. It's gonna be a lot of us, it's just the reality. So that you know, makes all of their systems harder. We're still gonna lose lines, we're still gonna lose power. So generators have to be in place. Again, these are community solutions. These are so solutions that we impact as residents, as homeowners, as neighbors, as family and friends. Like that's gotta be the ultimate goal. Yes, there's resiliency, and you showed earlier the piece of the puzzle. But it 
is just a piece of the puzzle. If we're not committed to this as a community, if we're not prioritizing these kinds of things in our day-to-day -day lives, we're gonna always play this game of catch up. So I'm gonna turn it to Cheryl on that level of uplifting notes. So <laughs>
alternative play of that than what we saw during Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Nicole. The recovery efforts for both of those was just phenomenal. Um, so like I said, we started this in 2017. We actually started on I-75. That was our first corridor. Uh, during Hurricane Irma, we evacuated about 6.8 million people from the state uh, over a very short period of time. And the interesting part of that was they all chose to go to Turnpike in 75. So they could have driven 30 more minutes over to I-95 from South Florida, and that road stayed at interstate speeds the whole time, but they all came to 75, where we traveled at 20 miles per hour or less. <laughs> So we have now not only expanded the emergency shoulder use to I-95, but we really made a concerted effort with our PIO partners to make sure that we're pushing that information out to people in the southern part of the state so that they utilize both roadways and move larger capacities more efficiently. Uh, looking at our own operations, when we talk about resiliency, certainly we start with our structure, our infrastructure in our building because we have to be able to stay there and continue working sometimes for three or four days straight until conditions are such that people can leave and, and their replacements come in. So our building is rated for 150 mile per hour winds, which should uh, do us the most anything that would be that far inland. We have two large diesel generators, and when I say large, they're very large. They will sustain us from four days if we keep everything at full capacity or we can meter some of our sources and extend to seven days. We are on a four day refueling contract. So as long as they can get there, they'll refuel us every four days and keep us going. We have battery backup on all of our computers and servers, and we have redundancies built in where we can for network connections. So that if we lose a communications hub because of infrastructure damage in one place, the idea is to be able to reroute that communication through another network system so that we can still maintain connectivity with all of our devices. And then certainly with staffing, uh, everything is 24 hours. The TMC, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That is a 24 hour facility anyway. Our road rangers over here on 95 are not 24 hours, but during these times we will turn them into a 24 hour service because we know a lot of people are gonna choose the overnight hours for evacuation. And we wanna make sure that we don't have any uh, people stranded out on the roads during those times. So some other things, we use a lot of technology in what we do. A lot of devices are called intelligent transportation systems or ITS devices. We have thousands of detectors out on the roadway that monitor that speed and volume that I talked about. We have a thousand, more than a thousand cameras here in Central Florida alone. Um, when we lose power or network connection somewhere, we lose those devices. So I no longer have my eyes on the road, which is what I use to make decisions in incident response. So we've looked for ways to backfill those gaps during these times of crisis. And sometimes it's super simple. We put cameras on our road ranger trucks, side forward and rear facing cameras on those trucks. If I lose a uh, network or power in an outage or in an area that takes out several of my cameras, I can turn on the camera for my road ranger trucks and at least not the bird's eye view that I'm used to, but I at least can see kind of what's going out on the road. I can see what they're responding to and I can make some decisions about what other resources need to be deployed. Uh, we've recently started uh, building these trailers. If you think about the big orange trailers, you see a construction zone with light towers and aero boards. We built those with cellular devices and cameras. So we can take those out, deploy them, leave them, and have a continuous monitoring system. We did that on the State Road 46 project that Suzanne talked about during Hurricane Nicole, we're able to keep an eye on that roadway throughout the term <coughs> of that uh, situation. Drones certainly have seen an emergence um, in every aspect of emergency management, but certainly here with the DOT, we use them extensively during the last hurricanes. Um, you think about a situation like over at Pine Island where we lost an entire uh, connecting bridge to an entire community. The inability to be able to access those facilities and see what's going on and to be able to plan your resources and start getting them ready to deploy slows down everything. So being able to use drones and get eyes on things out there so that we can see exactly what's going on and we can start getting our resources together and lined up ready to go as soon as, as, soon as the time comes. Radios, we for our road rangers use FHP's law enforcement radios and we also have a backup system that's cellular based. And we have partnerships with all of our cellular companies so that if we lose radio towers, we now don't, don't have radios. Um, but on the cellular side, I can have those guys bring in portable cellular towers so that we can keep those communications up because 
Now, if I don't have eyes or ears on the road, we certainly have a huge gap in our ability to respond. And then again, with uh, processes, looking at our staffing levels, like I talked about with road rangers, in the CMC, we're gonna go down to a skeleton staff uh, because we want people to be at home taking care of their families and their homes to the extent they can and be refreshed and ready to come in to relieve people. But that means I need to make sure the people who are in there are fully capable of handling a wide range of job functions that they may not do on a day-to-day -day basis. We certainly move into a more emergency management status um, with a different level of uh, communication and collaboration with our partners. And we also have a lot more reporting functions. So the 511 stuff that Secretary Tyler talked about, we're also pushing stuff out to all the navigation applications. We're collecting a lot of information about damage that's coming in from our responders, from our road rangers, from different sources, and not only documenting that, but dispatching the appropriate people, and then coordinating that with our district office, our, op our operation charge, such as DJM's group, and all of that is then being communicated and shared with Tallahassee as well, so that they can make decisions about resources. So a lot of moving parts, but looking for opportunities to cross-train, backfill um, devices and technology that we rely on on a day-to-day -day basis really helps keep things flowing and helps us, help the motoring public, to keep things moving. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Dibble. Uh, today I'm the director of state industry at Port. I wanted to focus on today just really how we prepare for, respond to, mitigate, and stay more resilient against heavy weather events. So right now in the off season, we all know we had Hurricane Ian, we had Hurricane Nicole. Um, everybody up here is a partner. We, did, we neighbor Kate Canaveral. We talk to them daily. I talk to John Scott weekly. I talk to Cheryl every weekend. Now we have an influx of passengers from cruise ships, which is great for the economy, but we need to stay more resilient on the infrastructure of the roadway. How do we manage that? How do we get passengers in and out? How do we not impact other operations? So right now in the off season, as far as for hurricanes and heavy weather events, we're looking at our past after action reports. That's number one. What did we do? What lessons learned? John talked about all the stats that, that he's seen from the county level. We're doing it internally as well. What did we learn from those past storms? What do we need to fix? What are those plans that we need to update? Number one, that improvement plan. So we identified those lessons learned from that storm. Are we actually completing those improvement plans? One of those is, is leveraging uh, mitigation projects, leveraging grant funding. Right now we started, we started the uh, local mitigation committee, the local mitigation, utilizing the LMS, the local mitigation strategy, looking at H, uh, HGMP funding, right? Hazard grant mitigation program funds. So what projects can we do? Like John stated, that mitigation is fun, right? We identify a known issue, whether that's going to be pump stations in and out in and around the port. Are they the Port Canaveral? Are they Cocoa Beaches? Working together with our partners, identifying how we get generators out there, leveraging that grant funding to make sure that we can stay more resilient for future issues, which we identified in Nicole. We had some several lift stations that were impacted as the storm exited through uh, Volusia, or excuse me, Indian River and came up. Monthly hazard surveys of all port facilities. This is really hot and heavy during the season. And it's very cargo driven. Right now, if you go to Port Canaveral, lumber, there's lumber everywhere. It's great, it's going to residential communities. We're building, uh, Central Florida is booming, it's great. However, it does cause issues when it comes to planning, making sure that we are, again, the, the key word, more resilient. So during the season, we go out there, we're doing monthly surveys of all of our tenants. We're checking their facilities, making sure that they have broken bales bundled up, making sure it's not just violation of fire code, but make sure that they're able to quickly uh, put things away, get them out of the port with a storm. We saw Matthew. We had three days to prepare for Hurricane Matthew. So the amount of cargo that we have at the port is great. It's coming in, but we need to make sure that we stay on top of it so that we're not behind the eight ball when we do potentially only have three days to prepare for a hurricane. Identifying staging locations. This is it's very it's kind of it's simple, but Port Canaveral is on a barrier island, so we can't necessarily identify staging locations in the port, in the city, on the barrier island. Where can we put them off-site on the mainland? In the event that we have a devastating storm, we saw in the DOT presentations that impact the causeway. So that's number one. We're working with, with um, DOT, with John, post-storm, as soon as the causeway is clear, we're coming in, we're doing damage assessment moving forward. Well, depending on the storm severity, we will store some equipment on-site, but a majority has to come off-site. You know how expensive fire trucks are, millions of dollars. We don't want to leave them out there. 
we saw Hurricane Ian um, and down there in the southwest area, the damage that they saw to a lot of their equipment. The number one staging location that we want to identify is for our survey vessels. We've heard three or four times already fuel. Fuel is number one to get back in and then our number one priority for Port Canaveral is to reopen the channel, get fuel vessels in, and get it back in, into Seaport Canaveral where all that fuel comes to the local community. So that's number one priority. So we have an open contract, we have a continuing contract with a surveying vessel. We stage them off-site. They're part of our damage assessment team. As soon as the tropical storm force went to the side, they come in with us, they clear the channel, they do a survey, depending on the outer condition. They'll do the outer reach, they'll clear it, share the information with us. More importantly, share the information with the Coast Guard that governs the waterway. We get the thumbs up, we open the channel with or without restriction. Number one priority is cargo fuel vessels. After that, after we get fuel in, then we're going to bring any passenger vessels that may have on the cruise ships that may have a sea evade that didn't come in ahead of time. Simple ordering equipment supplies, stockpiles, consumables. I know Veronica, she's back there. She's one of our engineers. She's working on these continuing contracts. That's something we're going to be doing now in the off season, making sure that our contracts with that survey vessel are current and up to date for the next upcoming season. We host a heavy weather annual meeting with all of our tenants. Just like we're doing right here, a symposium where we talk about what has changed, what lessons learned. The Coast Guard, again, governs our waterways, uh, how they're supposed to put in a remain in port request. That's any vessel that's, that's um, requesting to stay in port. The port is not a suitable refuge, so all vessels 500 gross tons or higher, it's governed by the Coast Guard, have to evacuate. Those under 500 gross tons are under the control of the Port Authority, and we will we will issue an evacuation order as well, depending on the storm under a unified command decision. And you can see in the picture in the top right, that's our marina district. We have about 220 vessels. Number one priority, is, especially with a storm such as Nicole, east-west storm is entering near Babar on the east coast. All those vessels will need out of the water. We don't want them to break loose, blow the channel, sink in the channel, impact our bridges, 401, impact the lock, we have any of those issues, that becomes the worst scenario for working out if there's a block channel. So that goes into my last bullet right there, commercial fishing and recreational vessels. When we do that heavy weather meeting, we're letting them know, we're reminding them of the policy, of the requirements that when there is a storm, we order this evacuation. I mean, we've been, I've been coming on seven years, we've been doing it very um, efficiently for the last seven years. The commercial fishing, they know, as soon as a storm's coming, they're already working behind the scenes, waiting for us to order that evacuation. They go to Bars Canal, they put their bow north in the Bars Canal, they tie up, they man their vessels, they ride out in the storm. They use that as a safe haven. We coordinate the movement with DOT 401 to make sure that the bridge is open and we allow vessels to go through at a time. We close it, that way we can have traffic exit from the space station. And we open it back up post-storm, we'll coordinate with commercial fishing, open it up at in intervals, and bring them back in. That way we can get them back up and running as fast as possible, not just the port. We want the commercial fishing and the recreational people to get back into, the, in, into their normal routine as quick as possible. So the objectives and priorities prior to landfall, the face closure of businesses. We have, there's a difference between the waterway and land side. So Brevard County orders a, an evacuation on the land. Businesses, operations in the port are following that. But waterway is governed by the Coast Guard. So we have hurricane conditions that go from whiskey, which means there's tropical storm force winds that are 72 hours out, all the way to Zulu, which is 12 hours out. At each one of those intervals, we have checklists internally in CPA that drive our action, each department. For anything from individual actions, department actions, to how we communicate to the public, to our tenants. So we have to make sure that we coordinate with our water side facilities, that their operations don't have to cease until the Coast Guard, which is at Yankee, operations have to cease. So sometimes we have to work through that as far as the communication issues because number one priority is getting fuel in, but also prior to a storm is making sure that we get as many trucks out as possible. So Seaport Canal, even if we're in Zulu, will be granted a waiver to allow fuel trucks to operate until the fuel, because they're independent drivers, operate until they feel that it's unsafe for them to cross the bridges. Uh, following Hurricane Irma, in the last 24 hours, 515 trucks went through Seaport Canal to make sure that we could fill up the gas stations prior to a mass evacuation. A uh, ride-out team, we contract with our county sheriff's office, Canal Cry Rescue, depending on the severity of the storm. 
They will keep teams on the court, on court property. As soon as the, the wind subsides, they'll do a windshield assessment, look for life safety issues. If there are none, they're gonna call us back for damage assessment teams. That's gonna be comprised of myself, the engineering team, those continuing contracts to work and get in the port. We're gonna clear the, surf, the channel, number one. We're gonna look at facilities, make sure that it's safe to reopen so we can get passengers in, and then to make sure that we, again, go back to normal operations as quickly as possible. Some of the past challenges that we saw in our recovery operations, we had a catastrophic loss of water supply after Irma, obviously being on a barrier island. There was a water break, was it north of the 520? It was just north of 520. Yeah, just north of 520, there was a severe water main break. It impacted us for several days. COVID responded quickly, and we got up and running, and we had intermittent pressure. But we didn't realize that NASA, or not NASA, but the Space Force Station had their fire line open. <coughs> so as soon as water was running, it was not getting us the pressure because they were just shooting out all their items. That was a policy that they had created. So we worked with COCO, we worked with the Space Force Station, not realizing them being downstream could impact our operations. So those are the things that we look at, those lessons learned on how to, how to correct that. So what we had to do for that, we had to get a canal fire rescue because we didn't have enough water for the fire suppression system to put a roving fire watch in and make sure that we could get passengers back. But more importantly, if you see those pictures, that is a pumping uh, equipment from Port Arthur able to procure within two or three days after Irma because a fuel terminal cannot operate without fire suppression. So that was a catastrophic issue for not only obviously the, the tenant but the community because we could not operate that until we were able to get that pump on hand, get it operational, the Coast Guard just gave the thumbs up and we get trucks back in they could operate. Their generator did not have enough power. Now fast forward now, they are fully generalized. That pump we actually own, so now it's a port property. It's uh, operated by Canal Fire Rescue. Things that we've looked at through, through leveraging that grant funding and how, how to get better to make sure that we're independent versus having to reach out. You know, we are proactive rather than being reactive. John hit, hit on it, power restoration. We all know we have that issue. Um, you know, hardening the poles. FPL is doing a good job, but we are going to always see issues. Uh, you know, the port, Critical infrastructure, we work with John, we work with FPNL about making sure that we are on that tier one, that power restoration, and we do have an issue. Probably Nicole, Ian and Nicole, we had the same time with the same exact power line near CT3. Wasn't much of an impact, however, we identified that impact the southern fuel terminal that is right off Fort property, which is Transmontane, which fuels all the south side. So we needed to make sure, coordinate with John, FPNL was out to within a couple hours to restore that. Then sea state conditions post harm. Number one priority I talked about was clearing the channel. Well, we need to make sure we clear the outer channel as well. So until the sea state subsides enough for that survey vessel to go out or the Army Corps additional or the pilots to go out, we have to make sure that what we'll do is we'll do the inner channel, get as much survey data as possible, get the Coast Guard's approval, and at the outer, the ocean side, right, the outer reach is too significant, we'll transition to the, the berth boxes where all the vessels labor, clear them, as soon as those sea state conditions subside, send the vessel right back out there. And we've been able to open up Fort Canaveral within 24 hours following these storms because of how, again, the continuing contracts, just how uh, proactive we've all been internally as a canal port but more importantly, our partners, our tenants, the partners up here, making sure that we're all on the same page and we have coordination events prior to. I already hit these, uh, so I'm not gonna go over too much, but you know, those considerations, making sure that we have pre-established contracts, mutual aid agreements. One of the issues from with the Irma, we talked about the water loss. We had six tender trucks come in with Canal Fire Rescue having mutual aid from six neighboring counties. So making sure that we have those mutual aid contracts. Um, and I already talked about it right here, just support partners, our resources, everybody here in the room, making sure that we're on the same page and we keep communicating. We know each other, we know each other's bases. So the time that we do have to reach out, we've already established that relationship. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lexi Miller. I'm the Resilience Engineering Services Manager for the City of Cape Canaveral. Um, Zach Eichel could not make it today, unfortunately. He's not feeling well, so he does say hi though. Um, <laughs> hi Zach, if you're listening. Um, so on a local level, really what we're seeing uh, are, are just you know the more tangible um, observations of those shocks and stressors, right? So on, and pardon me, I, this is Zach's content, so I have some notes and I'm preparing it or uh, that I prepared and that he also gave to me. So 
So we definitely, you know, we see we see the the shoreline erosion either from the lagoon or from the beach. You know, these these events that are hurricanes or rainy days um, are happening more and more frequently, almost to a point where some of these some of these things that should be a shock to our system are are happening continually enough that they're becoming stressors, right? So this was just kind of a rainy day. This wasn't an event. Um, this wasn't necessarily on anyone's major radar. It just I think it was like a Tuesday in March of last year. Uh, our presidential streets are a highly uh, residential area in our in our community, and they do see some of the some of the worst of the flooding that we that we get. Um, again, Tyler Ave. This is again just another afternoon thunderstorm. Um, sometimes these effects can compound. So if we have a, a high rainy week during during wet season, and then we have say Hurricane Ian a few days later, uh, we have this waterlogged system that interrupts our day-to-day -day operations, as John was mentioning, uh, and it just it becomes really, really clear on a local level, and then to, to Secretary Tyler's point, um, you know, it's organizational, it's human. When we think about our transportation systems, it's to, it's to move people from where they live to where they work to where they play, and how do, we, how do we build resiliency as a system so that we can have this movement and this, this transportation in our community? Uh, and so some of the challenges that we're facing in the city of Cape Canaveral are just these these threats that we get through flooding. Again, just another kind of rainy afternoon. You can see it's a clear sky, so the rain subsided pretty quickly, but we still have some water in the streets. It does flow through our system pretty quickly after that, but it still poses a threat kind of immediately, right? And it, it, we can't move our, move our people from point A to point B. Again, just more flooding. You can tell there's a lot of flooding. Maybe you can pick up on what we talk about a lot in the city is, is flooding and some of the threats from it. We work pretty extensively. As you see here, this is um, some aftermath from Hurricane Ian with uh, some, some rise in the Banana River Lagoon. And if you look kind of towards the, the back right corner, you'll see a PVC pipe sticking out of the wall from that outfall. This is our Center Street Basin outfall, one of our southernmost outfalls and basins in the city. Um, and that is one water level gauge that we have in a network that we've employed in the city of Cape Canaveral. We work really closely with Stetson University. We also have uh, a weather station from FAU where we're able to observe some of the trends in the lagoon since they've been installed. We do have some historical data that we rely on as well to see how much rise there is. But when it comes to these shocks and stressors, this network of recording devices and data is actually really beneficial to us to see some of this rainfall in action and understand you know, why we're seeing the inundation that we're seeing, whether it's related, whether it's a, just a single incident that can kind of be put into a vacuum. Um, and to Dr. Evans' um, words at Stetson University, who we, who we, you know, kind of work with the most, is that our stormwater infrastructure inundation is our canary in the coal mine when it comes to resiliency and the things that we need to be climate ready for. So the, the biggest challenge that we're facing is, is the Banana River Lagoon rise backing up into our stormwater system, backing up into our transportation system. Uh, this was in June of 2021, I believe. Again, just another severe flooding event just from a, from a rainy Thursday or a rainy Tuesday. Um, obviously on the ground, we get a lot of citizens who are highly concerned about this. It's a threat to their homes, it's a threat to, to our assets. Um, and to that note too, one of the things that um, we have to consider as a municipality and on a hyper-local level is the resiliency efforts and the mitigation that we do for, for our assets in our community. Um, again, just to, just to ensure that people you know, can get to where they wanna go because that place is still there. So having a transportation system to serve assets that are, that are safe and resilient and mitigated from these shocks and stressors and threats as well as a resilient transportation system. We have our crews go out, we have our um, quick response team. They go out and they, they keep an eye on some of the flooding in the city, so this is obviously a little bit later in the evening, it's getting dark. Um, hopefully those people didn't have anything really important in their mailboxes that they needed to get. <laughs> this is an example of one of our dashboards from our network. Um, we're able to just kind of see some, some of the action happen. So this was, sorry, I can't quite see what date it is. Um, this was just from one of our heavy rainfall days. It's, it was just a, a massive event very quickly. 
um, we see some some peak rays that are that are pretty intense, and so it just over overwhelms our system, and the water has nowhere to go because when it's raining on our roads, it's also raining on a lagoon, so kind of everything fills at the same time. And again, just some trend data. That's one of our uh, water level gauge slash weather stations. That's at uh, one of our parks on one of our piers. And then here's just some examples of some of the other um, devices that we have on our network. We have some weather stations, uh, one's on the city hall, one's over the public works building, uh, some more water level gauges. That allows us to also see like fetch in action when we, when we have hyper windy days um, that can also you know, contribute to the problem when it comes to stormwater infrastructure uh, being inundated. Some of the things that we're doing in the city to combat a lot of this, um, three of our main projects include our presidential streets master plan, right? So we get a lot of, uh, we'll call it nuisance, but nuisance flooding in our presidential streets. And the component that can affect transportation resilience there is that we, we want to do some major improvements and some, some changes to how traffic flows in that area. Uh, and with that, we can work with our partners like SPL to harden some of the utilities along those roads as we do as we do the work um, that we don't have to open up the ground more than once. Uh, we're also currently in the process of getting a tidal valve slash pump station or center street basin just to move that water away because we know it's getting backed up. Uh, and then additionally, sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me. Additionally, um, we are looking at a civic hub project where we're gonna be able to uh, basically create a community space and install underground stormwater chambers for storage in those areas that are prone to flooding just to get the water off of the road and away from people's homes and threatening those assets, transportation and otherwise, and into a space where we can more easily percolate it. Um, because right now moving the water, moving the water off of the road and into the lagoon isn't necessarily the resilient solution. Um, it's what we've always done, and it's, unfortunately it's not working as well as it used to, so we're trying to be a little bit more innovative um, when it comes to solving that problem. All right. Thank you, Lexi, and all of our panelists. Um, we will open it up for panel discussion, um, or if you have questions, I have prompt questions, or if the audience has some questions, Kathy has a microphone, um, and so we're I will go into my own questions. Um, so to all the panelists, how can resilience planning lead to economic growth and equity? Or who has a right to answer the main So, I mean, you, you heard it in my presentation, you heard it in everybody, it, it's, and even uh, Secretary Tyler said the same thing, it's, it's getting back to, you know, not bouncing back, but getting back to a better normal, right? So for us, reopening the port as quickly as possible to, one, it's fuel, right, priority, but it's, it's commerce. We talk about supply chain, making sure that we don't have that disruption that puts, it'd be both, right, that puts a shock and the potential of a lasting stressor on our local community, as well as Central Florida. Uh, you know, if we're not able to get into lumber ships because we have a issue, that bring now the residential boom, does that slow that down the housing market? Does that slow down the housing market in the air? Yes, it will. Fuel, we can't get that in as quickly as possible. You know, John's coordinating with the Sheriff's Department about re-entry. This is just short term. Well, the gas stations are now empty. How do we get people back to their houses? Now, what's the long-term problem if we weren't even to be able to get fuel in, right? We're gonna see that impact. It's the aggregate that comes in that's going to the construction market. So being more resilient, it goes hand in hand with that economic growth because especially from the port's perspective, we have to open as quickly as possible and the focus is to get commerce back up and running. Water side and shore side. All right. How can we better foster community awareness and understanding of resilience planning and actions? <coughs> so I mean, it starts, it starts with us understanding our risks. If you don't understand your risk, you don't know how to prepare for it. And we are terrible at understanding our risks. I mean, we struggle with people understanding whether or not they live on a ferry or island. <laughs> That's a more, I wish it was a, not a joke that it is, it's a thing. Um, so, I mean, we have, we have people, again, 
talked about we have all this water, you've heard about flooding. We don't have nearly the number of people who have flood insurance. We, we, all of us talk about the importance of flood insurance. I'm betting a lot of you talk about the importance of flood insurance. We hear the common refrain, I don't need a flood insurance. I'm not in a flood zone. 25% of all flood insurance claims happen outside of flood zone. People don't understand their hur that their hurricane insurance is wind insurance. Even though the legislator made it, made it clear that in giant letters, it says wind insurance. And then they have to find out that after they go through a traumatic event like a storm, the majority of their damage isn't covered because it's flood related, not wind related. So again, I talked about the, the role that we play as community members. All of us here go out and talk to the public. I'm sure a lot of you talk to the public. It makes a very small dent. Where we do see the larger dent, is what we talk to as neighbors and friends, right? So we can get on there, I can tell you about all the evacuations and what's coming with the storm, and what's gonna, what everyone needs to do. And then I would bet a large portion of us are guilty of this. We pick up the phone and we call our friends, our family members, and say, okay, I just heard the latest update, what are you gonna do? And I will tell you, as someone who sits on the inside, everyone thinks we have access to secret information, right? So they'll say, Tell me what the real scoop is. Well, the real scoop is the 30 minutes I just spent briefing. Like, that's the same. Giving the idea that we can make those impacts as, as, as members of our community, as friends, as family members, as church goers, those are the areas where we will make the biggest impact. That's how we sort of change this paradigm to get our residents to better understand our risks. We've got to do that before we get anywhere near resilience yet. So, clock it down. <laughs> Mike, I think you were about to jump in as well, or? Uh, I think I can add to it. Yeah, it's definitely a matter of helping people understand um, understand their risks. Uh, in the city of Cape Canaveral, we participate in the community rating system program through the National Flood Insurance Program, and it is it is it's a it's a, it's a lift when it comes for education um, and to help people you know kind of get it. And it's to what John said earlier. It's a uh, well, you know, it's not luck. Well, it is luck, and, and luck is it's not a reliable strategy to um, to mitigating risk and to, to being resilient. So you all talked about partnerships in each of your presentations. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any other partnerships that either need strengthening or need to be addressed in order to better address community resilience? One of our biggest challenges when we're looking at things from an incident response kind of scenario is um, attrition. You know, who I know this hurricane season and who I know are my key points of contact um, in each agency or each critical um, organization that I need to work with by next hurricane season is slightly different. I say they change. <laughs> um, and so that comes with preparedness, and we do a lot of work to prepare that and doing a lot of constant outreach throughout the year, making sure we stay in touch. We have quarterly meetings where we talk about incident response in general, and we dedicate the entire month of May to kind of strengthening our bonds for hurricane season. But that, I think, is one of those big challenges that not only affects us, but affects every single agency or organization working in emergency response is making sure you have the right people at the table and knowing who those are every step of the way because they do change frequently and rapidly. All right. Well, if we could get another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you for making a nine-minute break. Um, so if we can make some time at 10.30, um, please grab a refreshment, visit our poster.